Hello, wonderful. This is Sarah, and I'm here with Tracy Malone, who is the founder of Narcissist Abuse Support, and she's a narcissist abuse coach. Hey, Tracy, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Oh, uh, I'm excited. We were talking books before Tracy came on. I was telling her about my book, Toxic Person Proof, and she was telling about her book, Divorcing a Narcissist. You can't make this shit up, right, Tracy? <laughs> You really can't. People don't okay. believe you. So I love the title. <laughs> I want you to show the video people your little bumper sticker. My little sticker is uh, you can't make this shit up. Yeah, so my podcast people, she's got a, like a little bumper sticker and then a little a cute cup that we'll talk about here in a little bit too. But why is it so difficult to divorce a narcissist? Oh, divorcing a narcissist is, is um, probably the biggest challenge most people will have. It is something that you are taking the person that you've loved so much and seeing a different side of them. There's lying, there's hiding, there's manipulation, there's, you know, smearing and, and the false allegations that victims have to now defend. And, and this is from someone who's supposed to love you and they're fighting for the kids, but they really don't want the kids. They just don't want to pay any money. And it just becomes this cycle of crazy. And lots of my, my, um, my clients will go through three, four lawyers um, and deal with that sort of crazy because they're not getting the results they want. They're not getting, you know, responses back they email the lawyer and it's it's falls on deaf ears and nothing's moving forward and you know divorces with a narcissist like the average is about a year and you know if you're lucky and, and it goes well that's like more like the miracle than the actual truth i have clients that have been in their divorce for four to five years um, well, and i think there's this idea that like once it's like okay now i'm gonna stand up and do something about it that I think there's a real hope that the justice system becomes your like hero. Would it be? Or, or uh, you know, that they they actually, they, you know, the victim wants the validation to, uh, to have the court say, this isn't okay, what they're doing. They're looking for the court to step in and almost like the innocent until proven guilty kind of a thing, especially when it comes to the false allegations. Well, they're gonna know, you know, well, that becomes your job. And there is no innocent until proven guilty. It is defend yourself until you drop and, you know, maybe it will stick. And unfortunately, that's sort of the, the, the cusp and the journey of someone that's going to go through this. But in the end, when you do get free and you heal yourself, it is a different life. And you and I both know that um, it can be so much different. And that's what we have to, you know, reassure people that even though you're at the darkest, lowest point of your life, fighting someone that you loved, um, that you will have a different life on the other side. And isn't that where, when we think about our hero's journey and think about, oh, okay, yes, now I'm here. I think when you're in the legal process, the idea is that, oh, when that judge says you're a bad person, you know, then it's like, Oh, like the angels will come out. But then if the judge said that, all that would happen is you get back in your car and cry and then go home and then you got to start life again, right? Like it's, that's not the end game. That's not the final point. It's a, you have to go through that, you know? Um, but all the good stuff's on the, all the other good stuff is making yourself your own superhero, not trying to get a team of lawyers to be your superhero. Is that what you agree with, Tracy? Yeah. 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 Again, the, the, the person going through this has to learn to advocate for themselves. They have to learn to, um, you know, really dig for evidence for every false allegation that you're a bad mother, an alcoholic, a drug addict, and all the other things they throw at you. Bipolar is really popular. Um, when they throw that out, you're, you're defending yourself with proof. Hey, I didn't steal any money. Hey, I didn't do this. And here's all the records, you know, instead of taking that on internally to self like you know criticize yourself that hey i'm i'm doing something wrong what have i done did i steal money how could they interpret that you you, you go through this whirlwind of confusion when these things get thrown out there so understanding that your truth is in the paperwork i didn't steal here's the money you prove that i did instead of taking it on and and taking yourself down going oh no they hate me and i don't know what to do and everything's going wrong 
put on your big girl pants or big boy pants and really fight and just be like, no, I'm fighting with evidence. Here, I'm a bad mom. Well, here's the record of everything I've done. I take the kids to school. I do this, I do this, I do this. Well, that's right. You haven't ever been to school. Do you know where it is? You know, again, you're proving that you are the good parent mm -hmm. with evidence. And therefore, it can't bother you that they're calling you a bad parent. When we internalize that, oh my gosh, am I really a bad parent? That I made a mistake. We all make mistakes, right? But it's it's learning the controls to not let that um, take you down. Mm -hmm. and there's stages of recovery, right? After so that something doesn't come down, um, and that's your that's that's your, that's your go-to right now, isn't it? The, the stages of recovery. Tell us about that. So, so I, you know, the way I, I have it mapped out is um, the stages of recovery, we have to go through them. And it's it's not necessarily linear. We can certainly swirl around on the different stages. But I think the first one is, is um, you know, when we are a victim mm -hmm. and um, we're, you know, injured, we're destroyed, you know, we're, we're trying to understand what's going on. When you're a victim of a crime, like people know you are a victim of a crime. When you're a victim of abuse, they're like, well, it's because you're a codependent. Oh, you don't have any boundaries. They victim blame us. There's a difference, right? We have to come to the realization that this was something that happened to me and it's not me, it's them. And when you understand that, you can move out of it, right? So when you're you're facing the, the truth about being a victim, like that self-internalized message of I did something wrong has to be one of the first things that we have to learn to let go of. Um, and we also have to learn when we're the victim about the different types of abusers, right? Lots of people don't have any clue when you're really in the, the, the deer in the headlights and learning about this, um, what's a covert narcissist? What's the difference? Like I have people that say, mine never got angry, mine didn't cheat, so I must not be with someone like that. Well, do they lie, cheat, all these other things, right? We could sit there and make a list and then they're like, oh yeah, right? But people also have this false like narrative that they would be able to see someone that's a nurse. So more like a flamboyant, grandiose sort of thing. So that covert, you know, sort of stealth abuse, that behind the scenes stuff is something you have to understand that that's not normal. And so when you start to find that evidence, you start to look at guilt and shame and gaslighting, you can start to heal. Also, well, I, that's why it's so hard to get help too, right? Like I think about, um, you know, Bill Cosby, we all know and love Bill Cosby growing up. And I remember hearing that, or, you know, uh, who's the guy in um, Penn State, Sandusky, okay. right? Yeah, you know, he's like this hero, this football coach thing. Yeah, he was like this hero. He ended up he was molesting all these children, but he was like known as this like great person and community. And that's exactly it. People don't like to believe that they could be fooled. Mm -hmm. Right. It's to understand that and unsay, this is what happened to me. Check the list and go, that's yeah. what happened to me. But then like they have to become detectives in this state. If you don't become a detective, you can't, detective, you can't move out of the next part. I heard it called Sherlocking recently. I was like, well, that's a good word. That is so cute. Yeah. I'm sitting there, like sometimes in a divorce situation, for example, you're hiring a PI. What's mm -hmm. happening? You might be hiring forensic accountants to dig into the financial records of the money that's being hidden or, you know, wasted. You're, you're spying on your ex. Some people will do that and like put trackers under their car to learn the truth that they're really not going to the office, right? Mm -hmm. um, location services. And someone who's a victim really has a lot of PTSD or CPTSD symptoms. So they're foggy, they're always on guard. Um, there's just like this numbing pain and the fear and the anxiety just like choke you. They just come up and you're like, oh, they can't even sleep at night, right? So someone who's a victim feels alone and isolated and confused by the past because now they're just unfolding that. So the confusion is one of the biggest things. Yeah. In the fog, right? Like living in that fog. Yes, yes. Hyper vigilance, right? They're they're like just don't know where to go and they're hopeless. They don't see a way out of this because it's such a, a tsunami of emotions and reality. Like I was married to somebody that was abusive, you know, and I didn't know it. They they had that shame, right? Um, but if you think about the the um, victim again, they hide their story. 
the shame is so like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that. And they have no awareness to be out there and, and spread it. Well, how do you move out of victimhood into the next stage? Well, the next stage is a survivor, right? This is where you have, um, you know, started to prosper. You're starting to let go of the victim like mentality. You're, you're finding a way because you've got this new vocabulary until you have that vocabulary and go flying monkeys and gaslighting and smear campaigns and all these words, there's just stuff that's being done to you. When you have the vocabulary, you start to get out of that hole, right? You start to trust yourself and you start to build things that um, make you feel better. You're starting to self-love, you're starting to seek help um, and know that this was done to you. So you start to take, you know, workshops and, you know, go to summits and things like that, where like, oh my God, I just like did eight hours of, of different things. And, and people go to, you know, YouTube all night long and sit there and listen to videos. But when they're in that survivor state, they now are not hopeless, they're hopeful. Mm -hmm. And they, they're still not quite there, but they're better, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's how you do it, is you have to do the work. The work is talking to people, getting some coaching, getting some counseling, and that's how you move into the next step. So victimhood, helpless, a sense of loss, a sense of confusion. But then you start to make steps. So the baby steps in victimhood, right, is collecting evidence, Sherlocking, as you said it so eloquently, which I loved. And then you move into survivor. And then being a survivor is being basically informed, mm -hmm. right? And, and through that information, you start to build a different uh, structure in your head, a different structure in your mind of like, okay, that's what happened. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, that happened to her too, right? And it takes um, some of the self-blame, like when you have the words and you have it, and that's part of the recovery mm -hmm. to understand it all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but I always say, and I, I bet you agree, studying narcissism is a great place to start, but it's not where you want to finish. No, no. Right? <laughs> so what comes after Survivor? <laughs> this is where my word, I love it, I even have it over my head back there, is uh, Survivor. This is where we have been through hell and back and we're a warrior and um, we learn to be present in the moment. This is where we start to read the other books. This is where we're learning self-love. This is where we're learning boundaries. This is where we're learning about abandonment issues. And we're also doing the research to go, why me, right? So many times survivors end up um, digging up like things they didn't even know about their past. Like, oh my goodness, my mother, my family. Oh, wow, you know, and then it makes more sense. So the closer we get to the internal healing, the closer we come to becoming a survivor, we've actually not only learned to spot the dangerous people and the flags, right? So we're just like, red flag, red flag, but we've actually like passed tests. We've had that narcissist yeah. that work come into our life and we went, whoa, I see what this is and we've passed it. We've, you know, had the strength to walk away from somebody that is like that, right? We might go, oh gosh, they look so good on paper. Maybe again, those excuses, maybe it's just that they're a little bit like this or they're like, you know, we can make excuses all day long, mm -hmm. but it's having the courage to go, sorry, three strikes, you're out. You lied, you cheated, you this. No, I'm not staying. And despite how it looked on paper to get yourself out of the next situation, that's when you're a survivor. It's not just knowing it on paper because people are like, I read all these books, but I don't know. And I'm like, go out and practice it. And when you practice it, you'll find the ones and you'll learn the skills to be stronger. Make sense? And you learn the skills through practice, right? And that's where I think it's really important because, you know, people say, well, how do you build confidence? Well, you, you test yourself and, you know, to me, I won't, you know, maybe agree with this. I love your opinion on this, Tracy, because I see, oh, people, I'm good. I'm strong. I'm amazing. Okay, that's great. That's like first level confidence. But people who are truly confident tested themselves. They put, you know, and overcame and that built a muscle and then it built another muscle and then built another muscle. You know, and that's a whole, my whole thing, obviously being toxic person proof on the toxic person proof podcast. It's like, there's some people who have a lot of muscle building and saying, I'm going to act in my, I'm going to act in integrity to myself. Not only am I going to see that that's a red flag, I'm not going to talk myself out of it. Exactly. Absolutely. And, and also there's a part of, 
it could be called letting go and it could also be radical acceptance of the things that we will never have an explanation for. Like preach what? it, girl. Okay. Yes. Yes. It's not about holding on to why would they do that? It's yes. going, I'll never know. And frankly, I don't care. Well, they do it because they're toxic. And what we wrestle with is why are toxic people this way? And no one has that answer. <laughs> There's lots of opinions, you know, nature, nurture, trauma, selfish, you know, brain structure. There's lots of conversation around that, which um, maybe I'm hopeful with brain scans and genetic testing um, mm -hmm. as we move forward, you know, the science behind it rather than, yeah, the, I don't want to say other than the psychology, because that's not what I mean, but the partnering, right? As, as we, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, this, and again, it's, it's our own internal stuff too. Like yeah. this is where we have to learn to like stand up for ourselves, to set that boundary, to say no. So many victims like lost their ability to set a boundary because when they tried with the narcissist, it didn't work. So they simply stopped because it was the, the path of less resistance. It was, I won't walk on eggshells. If I stand up for myself, like it's going to be a shitty weekend, right? So they just stop. And I, I tell people to hold on to the boundary as always setting it because when you stop setting it, they win. Regardless of their success of setting that boundary, don't stop trying because when you stop trying, they know they have you. So just keep on trying to do that. So I have a story about boundaries. Uh, and by the three little pig stories, I'm a, you know, it goes along with what you're saying. And it's like, there are three little pigs. Like one had hay boundaries or straw, you know, straw boundaries. The next little pig had stink boundaries and the next little pig had brick boundaries, but none of them changed the big bad wolf, mm -hmm. right? He just kept blowing. He just kept, because I, I do think that's an important conversation because I, I, too often I hear, well, the purpose of boundaries is to change their behavior. Mm -hmm. And often it doesn't. We wish it did, mm -hmm. right? But toxic people don't change their behavior. No, but it's, it's about the rules for someone to be in your life. This is not okay that you just treated me that way. That's setting a boundary regardless of their changing their behavior, as you said, right? It's well, the, the brick boundaries keep the wolf out, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And, and thinking about keeping the wolf out, mm -hmm. not working on boundaries to hope the wolf turns into a bunny rabbit. <laughs> that's right? Yeah. That's what some people do, right? And that's why I heard, oh, you know, I know my... The guy I'm with is this, but I'm just going to counseling and work on my boundaries. And it's like, oh no, what do you think that's going to do? You know, I mean, it is important work, right? Again, I think it's important to know if within the spectrum of toxic behavior, little bitty baby toxic, maybe that will be really helpful. Big bad wolf toxic, the wolf, the boundaries there to protect you. Absolutely. Not to change wolves. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I want to say one more thing about the, the survivor person is, is when they're in that state, the darkness, the fog, right? Yeah. Sure. They're, they're just not walking around in a spacey zone and they yeah. find gratitude for everything. Like in those earlier states, you can't even like, what am I grateful for? No, I, I you're just searching for your old life, but gratitude for everything and oneness. So hopeless, hopeful and oneness is where you oh. want to be. You want to be where I am here in the life and I'm living in the present. And um, if you really look at everything that happened, you can actually find lessons in what it was. I needed to learn. I didn't know about abusive people. I needed to learn boundaries. I needed self-love. Um, I needed to practice self-love, not just have us posted on my mirror, but say, I'm not staying. This isn't okay. And I think it's really important because I think sometimes the lessons we want to learn or try to talk ourselves into learning, well, I need to be more accepting. I need to be more forgiving. I need to not leave people in their darkest days. I need to, well, you know, personality sort of the mental health issue. If they had cancer, I wouldn't leave them. So if they have a mental health issue, right? It's those kind of things that we spin around in our head. But I love that when you said the lessons we're supposed to learn, boundaries, Staying away from toxic people, you know, and I, I joke and I say the, the let maybe the lesson is there are toxic people and you should stay away from them. Maybe that could be the lesson you learn. Not that you have to bend yourself a thousand different ways and be less selfish. You're already not selfish enough. Exactly. And and also look at what you're vulnerable for. Yeah. Oh yeah. 
right? That goes back to your, oh gosh, my family of origin was nutty. So this became normalized to me. I used to say when I learned about ghosting, I'm like, that was my family vacation. Like our family was so dysfunctional that at no point was everyone ever talking to each other. Um, It was just ghosting, 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 ghosting. And so when I lived it with a, a, a relationship, I was like, oh, that's just normal. They need their space. Again, the excuses, right? Yeah. But what are your vulnerabilities? Oh gosh, I have to heal that wound. I have to look at abandonment because of my family of origin, because abandonment and fears that we've had from the past end up coming into this relationship and mm-hmm. it doesn't help us very much. No, it does not help us very much. And, and sometimes our strengths can be vulnerabilities too, right? Like if you think about loyalty, mm-hmm. wow, loyal to the end. I never give up. That's a fabulous quality. That's not a wound to heal, but it's an advantage the toxic person can have over you. Absolutely. I have this course on my website about how to change the story because yeah. I believe that our, our story, everyone's like, I'm a narc magnet. This has happened three times. And, and I, I want to take that sticker off their head and go, your story attracted them. You are that patient, loving, caring, giving. When you tell the story about your husband cheating nine times and you stayed, you think you're telling a hero story. You think that you're in a place where, look, I stayed, I'm loyal, I I keep to my vows. But what's happening if you're telling it to the wrong person, i.e. a narcissist or abuser, right? They're going to see opportunity. I actually have a little green flag on my desk. They're going to see a green flag. Oh, she stayed with her husband when he cheated. I can cheat. Oh, awesome. And how about your family? Are they around? Are they close to you? No, they're all crazy and they live somewhere else. Oh, goody, isolation. I can get her, right? Everything you tell in your story, including your positive traits, are what attracts them to you. Your loyalty, as you said, you you, you put that on the center, they're gonna say, I can eat it up. I can, I can be, I can pretend to be everything you want. Because if you're looking for someone to feel that, fill that wound, I'll be it. And so we have to be really careful about what we say until we know it's safe. Absolutely. I love it. Tracy, thank you so much. Where can people find more about you? Um, well, you can go to my site, NarcissistAbuseSupport.com. Um, I have a Facebook group and all of my social media. I'm pretty much everywhere. So they can find me all on that website. Um, and we love to gather information. So we have every support group that we can find all over the country listed on there. There's just so much support. Therapists that do this work, go find stuff on the site and you'll see me there. I love it, Tracy. Thank you so much. Any last words of wisdom uh, for our audience? I think the most important thing when people are going through this is to find support. Don't try to do it alone. Don't try to like tap into your friends. You will find quickly that they don't know how to help you. So join a support group, get with a coach, get with a therapist and don't try to do it alone and go to the library and get a book. <laughs> just go Get our books that are about to come out, right? <laughs> they may have come out by the time this releases. your <laughs> book and then in a few months you can get my book and everything <laughs> But it is about learning and and don't stop that learning tree just because they're gone. Go on to the things that are going to be to heal your own soul. I love it. I love it. Tracy, thank you so much for helping us on our journey to become toxic person proof.